Gracious Lord, Heavenly Father, thank you, God, so much for your love and your guidance. I ask you, Lord, for the, I ask you, Father, for the Holy Spirit to abide in me, that all things may come to remembrance and order and in peace. And things that are not revealed to me through the Holy Spirit, Father, let it be revealed in this message. Blessed be your name, God, in all we do. In Jesus' name, amen. First of all, I'd like, I'd like to welcome you to this message called God, uh, the series, God's Final Message. And the topic today is called the, the Deception, Part 1, about Christian and pagan holidays. But before I get into this topic, I ask you to please watch the last two previous topics, the law is done away with and also the Sabbath. It will give you a broader understanding where I'm coming from on this topic here. Now, the first deception that I believe is that people are saying that it doesn't matter what church you go to as long as we're worshiping the same God. But I, I have to question that because I want to know how Jesus wants me to worship him. We can add our own beliefs, our own tradition. But what if Christ doesn't want that in our church? And one of the greatest deception is that the Saturday Sabbath has been changed to the first day of the week. Now, we've seen through the last topic uh, how this was impossible. It wasn't even written in the Bible that God said himself that he changed the Saturday Sabbath, seventh day of the week, to the first day of the week. We found in the church of Ephesus, which is the first church in the, in, in the book of Revelation, is a Catholic church, which actually that first Catholic church went to church on Saturday. So through the scripture, we couldn't find the, the Sabbath been changing from Saturday to Sunday. There's nowhere in the scripture that Jesus said it himself. But we do find it in history. 300 years later, we find that the Roman Emperor Constantine actually changed the day from Saturday Sabbath to Sunday Sabbath to call so that he may unite his, pe his people. Uh, so Bishop Sylvester also says, in the year 325, Sylvester Bishop of Rome changed the title of the first day, calling it the Lord's Day. So it was man that called the first day of the week, calling it the Lord's Day. It wasn't Jesus Christ. Catholic records, uh, records, September 1, 1923. Sunday is our mark of authority. The Catholic Church is above the Bible, and this transference of the Sabbath observance is proof of that fact. These are not my words, my brothers and sisters. These are the Catholic records that, that is from September 1st, 1923, they clearly state that it was them that changed the Saturday, Sabbath to Sunday instead of the seventh day as Jesus Christ asked us, commanded us to do, to obey his, to remember. It's amazing the Ten Commandments, it says, thou shalt not, thou shalt not, thou shalt not. But on the Fourth Commandment, Jesus says, remember that God knew at one, step, one time in, the, in this generation that we will forget his Sabbath. And then he says, honor thy father and thy mother. That God knew that the generation of our time will actually start to disobey our parents. Here's another record, Chancellor Albert Smith, the Cardinal of Baltimore. He says, Protestants would follow the Bible. They sh if Protestants would follow the Bible, they should worship God on the Sabbath day, which by God is Saturday. And keeping the Sunday, Sunday, they are following a law of the Catholic Church. So these are the records. They clearly state it's not really a deception, my brothers and sisters. In fact, this is, this is actually being bold as a church to say that it was them. But a lot of people are still trying to find ways in the scriptures to say that, no, Sunday is the Sabbath day. We should go to church on Sunday we should, because of it's all tradition, my brothers and sisters. We found out that we worship God every day. It doesn't, we worship God every day, not just one day out of the week. But according to Luke 4.16, Jesus Christ went to church on Saturday. The Convert Catechism of Catholic Doctrines says we observe Sunday instead of Saturday because the Catholic Church transferred the solemnity from Saturday to Sunday. It wasn't Jesus Christ, my brothers and sisters. It was the, it was the Roman Catholic Church. The Catholic priest T. Enright, lectured at Hartford, says this in 1844, 1884. I have repeatedly offered a thousand to to any a thousand dollars to anyone who can furnish any proof from the Bible that Sunday is the day we are bound to keep. The Bible says, remember the Sabbath day to keep it holy. But the Catholic Church says, no, keep the first day of the week and the whole world bows in obedience. Now remember, a thousand dollars in the 1800s was a lot of money. And yet they were placing their money on what they were stating because history tells us it was actually the Roman Catholic Church. 
Here's what a, uh, Dr. E.T. Hiscox, author, a bap who, who's the author of a Baptist manual, and he says this. There was and is a command to keep holy the Sabbath day, but the Sabbath day was not Sunday. I ask where can the record of such a transaction be found? Not in the New Testament, absolutely not. And this is coming from the author of a Baptist manual. Dr. R.W. in the congregation, it is quite clear that however rigidly or devotedly we may spend Sunday, we are not keeping the Sabbath. The Sabbath was found on specific divine commandment. We can plead no such command for the observance of, the, of Sunday. There is not a single line in the New Testament to suggest that we incur any penalty by violating the supposed sanctity of Sunday. My brothers and sisters, it's clearly stated, even other denominations and the for, their forefathers are sharing the statement that Sunday was a transference from the church to, as, a, as, a, as the Lord's day. Presbyterian, canon eaten in the Ten Commandments. There is no word, no hint in the New Testament about abstaining from work on Sunday and to the rest of Sunday no divine law enters. And Anglican, Isaac Williams, and where are we told in the scriptures that we are to keep the first day at all? We are commanded to keep the seventh day but we are nowhere commanded to keep the first day. The Methodist, Amos Binney, Reverend Amos Binney, it is true that there is no positive command for infant baptism, nor is there any keeping holy the first day of the week. Many believe that Christ changed the Sabbath, but from his own words, we see that he came from no such purpose. Those who believe that Jesus, Jesus changed the Sabbath based it on own superstition. These are other Protestants. These are other believers from another denomination are saying the same thing. My brothers and sisters, we can believe what we want to believe, but it's clearly stated that Jesus Christ did not change the Sabbath from Saturday to Sunday. It was man's tradition. And Acts 5.29 tells us that we ought to obey God and you're probably thinking, we shouldn't talk about other churches. Well, we're not, you're not reading the scriptures the way how I read the scriptures. In fact, in Matthew chapter 7, it says, Beware of false prophets who come to you in sheep's clothing, but inwardly, are, are, but outwardly, there are, they are ravenous wolves. First, uh, 2 Timothy 4 verse 122, For the time has come when people will not endure sound teaching, put having itch itching ears. They will accumulate for themselves teachers to suit their own passions. Second Peter 2 verse 1 to 10, but false prophets also arose among the people, just as there will be false teachers among you who will secretly bring the destructive, the destructive heresies. My brother and sisters, right here, the Bible is telling, you, telling us to beware of these false teachers, these false prophets that are coming into our belief system, coming to a system of our churches. Because like Lucifer in heaven, he didn't try and deceive the people saying that he's going to be evil. He didn't come to us like he's saying he's Satan. He's coming in the angel of light. He transforms himself in the angel of, of light according to 2 Corinthians chapter 11, verse 14. And no marvel for Satan himself has transformed him to an angel of light. Therefore, it is no great thing if his ministers also be transformed as the ministers of righteousness, whose end shall be according to their works. See, the only way the devil can deceive us, my brothers and sisters, is to teach us a different way how to worship God, to infiltrate his paganism. Remember, the Bible said in Isaiah 14 that he wanted to be like God. He wanted to be like the Most High. That means he is telling the angels that he can be good like God because the God we serve is not evil. In Luke 19, verse 45, it says, And he went into the temple and began to cast out them that sold therein and them that bought, saying unto them, It is written, My house is the house of prayers, but you have made it, made it a den of thieves. Even Jesus Christ, when he saw something wrong in the church that is not biblical, my brothers and sisters, he went and did something about it. And that's what we have to do. When we see something that's, that's pagan, that's, there's a paganism that's infiltrating our church and people are starting to worship, we have to speak out. We can't just believe boldly because everyone else is believing it. Here's a deception too. Speak, speaking of, of uh, paganisms that are infiltrating, one of the greatest deception I believe is called the Christmas and Easter, Christian pagan holidays. Now, one, one person asked me, is Valentine's, Valentine's Day a pagan day? I believe it's a public holiday that is referred to people to show their loves to their loved ones. Easter, all practicing. Easter, 
Christ our Passover. Now it's told that Easter is the Passover where Jesus, where Jesus resurrected. He died and resurrected. But is it truly Easter as it's referred to the unleavened bread or Passover? Let's look at the scripture. In Acts chapter 12 verse 1 to 4, it says this. Now about that time, Hero the king stretched forth his hands to vex certain of the church. And he killed James, the brother of John, with the sword. And because he saw it pleased the Jews, he proceeded further to take Peter also. Then were the days of the unleavened bread. When he had apprehended him, he put him in prison and delivered him to four quaternions of soldiers to keep him, intending after Easter to bring him forth to the people. So we see in the same chapter, they refer to the day, the unleavened bread, and then all of a sudden they change it to the word Easter. Now, where is the word called Easter? Is it actually for the unleavened bread? So we looked in through history and we find out that in Easter, according to the Council of Nicaea, it says in 325 AD, decree, there was a decree that Easter should be observed on the first Sunday following the first moon after the spring of equinox, which is March 21. Easter therefore can fall on any Sunday between March 22 and April 25th. So here we see here through history that told us that the first Easter Sunday that happened, they, they made it as a celebration, was in 325 A.D. But here in a Passover, we have a Passover. There's an update called My Jewish Learning. gives an update when the actual Pas Passover should take place during that year. So the Pas Passover for 2020 begins on sundown on Wednesday, April 8th, and ends Thursday evening, April 16th. So if Easter and Passover were actually the same thing, then why are they celebrated on a different time, different date? The first Passover cedar is on the evening of April the 8th, and the second Passover cedar takes place on the evening of April 9th. So we see here, the Easter, uh, when you have Easter, they sing songs, they praise, they, they gather with families and friends, they eat ham as a main dish, dress, dress in a rabbit costume, Easter, and they have Easter egg hunts. With the Passover, they sing songs and praise, praise God. They gather with families and friends. They eat only live, living, uh, living fruit for eight days, and they dress in Passover clothes. Now, there are some similarities, but there is a big difference, my brothers and sisters. In fact, what does rabbit and eggs have to do with Jesus Christ? We, it's fun. It's great to do Easter because this is, there's a lot of activities for the kids. It's fun for the family. But just because it's fun, does it, does it mean it's right? We see the Passover. No one doesn't want to go for eight days with, un, with living bread. <laughs> so let's look at the rabbit and the fertility. As you see, it refers to the god of fertility. Astate, Astaroth, Astaroth. Ashtoreth, Asherah, Easter, Ashta, Easter, Aphrodite. So the word Easter comes from Asate, which is the god of fertility, also known as the queen of heaven. Now, I know there's a lot of people saying it's not, it's not, but bear, bear with me right now. I can prove to you this is actually referring to the pagan goddess, the god of fertility, Ishta or Esther or Easter. Now, the, right here we will see she is also known as the queen of heaven. But you know who else is called the queen of heaven? St. Mary. In Deuteronomy 16, Thou shalt not plant thee grove or any trees near unto the altar of the Lord thy God, which thou shalt make thee. Neither shalt thou set thee up an image which the Lord thy God hateth. So you see, we see in the scripture that God is telling them no pagan gods, no pagan idols allowed to be built here. Now the word, the Hebrew word grove, he says thou shalt not plant thee a grove. The Hebrew word for grove is asherah grove for an idol worship, a Babylonian astate. So we see that the pagan goddess was written in the Bible, and this is old paganism that happened before Jesus Christ. But they use Easter, astate, that God said do not plant, to plant an idol that way. They use it as a way of uh, sneaking astate into the death and resurrection of Jesus Christ. See, the queen of heaven in Jeremiah 7, verse 18, also 40, chapter 44, verse 17 to 25, she is the mother of Tammuz in Ezekiel 8, verse 14, who is also her husband. See, Tammuz, Samarimus, also as Date, is the wife of Nimrod. 
And Nimrod died and went to the sun and took over the sun and he became the sun god. And the wife Samirimus was impregnated by his sun race and then she gave birth to a half god and half human, Tammuz. Does that story ring a bell? Half god, half human, and Tammuz was a strong man, a man of ox? Hercules. So here we see that when he grew of age, Samirimus married her son. These, per these perverted rituals will took place at the sunrise on Easter morning, Ezekiel chapter 8, verse 13 to 16. According to the ancient writings, the wife of Nimrod was Samirimus. She had a love named Tammuz, which was also her son, and he got killed by a wild boar, listen to this, a wild boar on a hunting trip. Pigs are not even kosher, and the people wept for 40 days for him. This is where Lent has its origins, and then he was supposed to have risen from the dead. My brothers and sisters, does Lent, the 40 days Lent, this is the origin of the 40 days Lent, because when Tammuz died by a wild boar, they, they, they gave worship to him for 40 days. According to the Catholics, Lent is derived hopeofisrael.org. According to the Catholics, Lent derived from the 40 days Yeshua spent fasting in the wilderness, but is admitted that the observance of Lent was unknown to the disciples, and it did not find its way into the church until several centuries. After the time of the Messiah, Lent was an indispensable preliminary, preliminary to the great annual festival and the commemoration of the death and resurrection of Tammuz which is celebrated by alternate weeping and rejoicing. So the 40 days of Lent is connected with the Babylonian goddess Astareth Astate Ishtar, the origin of the word Easter and the worship of Tammuz. My brother and sister, the 40 day Lent is referred to Tammuz, who is also born on December 25th. Every year on the first Sunday after the first full moon, after the spring of equinox, a celebration was made. It was Easter Sunday and was celebrated with rabbits and eggs. Easter also proclaimed that because Tammuz was killed by a wild boar, that a wild boar must be eaten on that Sunday. This is why the Sunday ham that we have, that, that uh, our brothers and sisters have on Sunday, is not because of the Easter, had nothing to do with Jesus Christ's death and resurrection. I mean, the Jewish, the Israelites, the Jews, they didn't even have, it was forbidden, it was a forbidden food to eat. And yet they have it on that day because it, it has something to do with Tammuz, has nothing to do with Jesus Christ. Easter, as we know it, comes from the ancient pagan festival of Astate, also known as Easter, pronounced Easter. This festival has always been held late in the month of April. It was in its original form, a celebration of the earth, regenerating itself after the winter season. The festival involves the celebration of reproduction. A rabbit, my brothers and sisters, my friend, is, the, is a symbol of fidelity. We use the symbol in our times with pornography. In fact, the Greek w porn is actually a Greek word that translates prostitution. So Miramis proclaimed that Nimrod, now the sun god Baal, would be present in the flame of a candle. In this new mystery religion, Samirimus was known as the goddess Ishtar, the queen of heaven, who was immaculately conceived. So she was saying that, you know, when she was pregnant and, and Nimrod already died, the people were going to kill her. So she said that, no, no, you can't kill me because Nimrod went to, to take over the sun. He became the sun god. And what happened, his sun rays impregnated me. And so she was pregnant with Tammuz. And when, and when they asked her, how did, you, uh, how did this all happen? And they said, because of the sun rays, and plus she is the god, that, and she, she, she's the god, god of the moon as well, and that she had a ship that she came down from uh, that's shaped like an oval, like an egg. And so they asked, let me read this. This giant egg had landed in the Euphrates River on the first Sunday after the first full moon, after the spring of Enoch, and became known to the ancient pagan world as the Easter's egg. In English, we will pronounce this Easter's egg. Easter's egg is pronounced Easter's egg. So it was a ship that they were looking for because she said she came down in a ship shaped as an egg, as an oval ship, as an egg. And they went looking in the Euphrates River. This is where we get the teaching when we get our kids to look for the egg. 
It is all paganism. And I know a lot of believers, Christian people that even know this, even in Seventh-day Adventist churches, I know they know this, but they still practice this teaching. I know it's fun. I know it's joyful to get all the kids. But my brothers and sisters, is it right? Christmas. The word mass and Christmas means is derived from a Latin word to mean to dismiss, as in a funeral mass. Mary means happy. Therefore, Merry Christmas means happy dismissal of Christ. So when everyone's saying Merry Christmas, in Latin, if you separate the words, it's actually saying happy dismissal of Christ. In fact, Christmas has nothing to do with Jesus Christ. There's no evidence to show that Jesus Christ was actually born on December 25th. We can see in the Bible, this is a time of winter, and we can see in the Bible that the sheep were out, during that time, and they can see the stars. That's how the three, men, the three wise men were able to see that star. So it wasn't winter during that time of, of the birth of Jesus Christ. We can see it had to be earlier than December. But what does a reef have to do with Christmas? See the reef? Remember, Merry Christmas means happy, happy dismissal of Christ. The wreath that they put on the door, this wreath is used for Christmas, but it's also used for funerals. Wreath is used for funerals. Santa and Leah were the, first were the first to celebrate Christmas, but not to celebrate Jesus Christ. So there was a pagan that actually started this, and then the Roman, the papacy actually implemented in the church. The pagan Rome Catholic, this is what history, HistoryToday.com says, the pagan Rome Catholic Church attracted Christians to celebrate their festivities by giving it a Christian name. So it was a pagan belief but they, what they did, they just changed the name to Christmas. Christmas was all about Christ, but, what, but who do the kids ask for? They don't ask for Jesus, they ask for Santa Claus. Who is Santa Claus? Well, Santa Claus is a is Saint Nicholas, Sante Nicholas. This is where we get Santa Claus. And he was known as a man that gave good gifts to the good kids, and, be, and, he, and he doesn't give any to the bad, so he determines who is good, and who was bad. Oh, you missed that part. He determined who was good and who was bad. And then if you are bad, you are sent into a person named Kronos. Kronos. Oh, sorry. Crumpen. You are sent into a person named Crumpen. Now, it's the same person. Saint Nick and Crumpus work together telling who's good and who's bad. This is the same person. In fact, Saint Nicholas received an old nickname called Old Nick. And if you look in the dictionary.com, you will find the name Old Nick is a noun known as the devil or Satan. So Saint Nicholas, Old Nick, its definition meaning is the devil. Crumpus is to derive from a Norse word crumpen, meaning claw. <laughs> so here we have Saint Nick, which is Satan, and Crumpus that derive from the word claw. Satan claw. Satan claw. Satan claw, Santa Claus, amen, Santa Claus. So who is Santa Claus trying to be? Well, let's look at the characteristics of Santa Claus. He has white hair like wool, has a beard, comes in red apparel, comes from the north, comes quietly in the night, judges the good and bad, rides a sleigh, and comes to give gifts. My brothers and sisters, Jesus Christ is this. Jesus Christ has white hair like wool, has a beard, comes in red apparel, lives in the north, comes as a thief in the night, judges good and bad, rides a chariot as a sleigh, comes to give rewards. My brothers and sisters, Santa Claus is trying to be Jesus Christ. He wants to be like a God. And this is the devil's main point from the beginning in the time of heaven, that he can be God without God. Amen. And we see here in history, this is history from ancient times, that you can see that Christmas is not a belief that God wanted us to follow. It is paganism, my brothers and sisters. It is tradition of man. We see here in front of the, the center, Rockefeller Center, you have a huge Christmas tree. Now, where did the Christmas trees come from? How does that relate to the death and resurrection of Jesus Christ? 
It has nothing to do with Jesus Christ, with Jesus' birth, uh, excuse me, with Jesus' birth. But we see here that they did a huge celebration one year and they started to sing uh, songs and Christmas carols and everybody and the kids came along and they had a huge Christmas tree in front of the Rockefeller Center. Not knowing that behind the people that were singing was a pagan goddess called Norse Odin. What is a Norse Odin goddess in the middle of the stage doing in the time of Christmas? Because my brothers and sisters, that Christmas, that pagan worship that people are always following has nothing to do with Christ, has everything to do with Tammuz. Tammuz is not the only pagan god that actually was born on December 25th. There was a lot of other gods and they try to, and the devil was trying to counterfeit. Because remember, the only way to destroy the original is to have counterfeits. So Satan will always try to, was building counterfeits before even Jesus came. So when the actual Messiah, the, the true God that came, a lot of people won't believe because there are so many just like him before his time and even after his time. Right here, my brothers and sisters, you will always, if you dig deep enough, you can see truth in Jesus Christ and false teachings in our churches. But the tree, it's amazing how they deck it with gold and you know the, the, the uh, beautiful decorations on the gold, the tree, the, the, the ones that look like uh, an apple. It's, it has nothing to do with Jesus Christ, my brothers. It's all paganism. Here, let me tell you how this was implemented because this is old. This is, ultra, this is old paganism teaching by the, by the heathens, according to Jeremiah chapter 10. It says, hear ye, hear ye the word which the Lord speaketh unto you, O house of Israel. Let's say the Lord, learn not the way of the heathen, and be not dismayed at the signs of heathen, for the heathen are dismayed at them. For the customs, listen to this, for the customs of the people are vain, for one cutteth a tree out of the forest, they cut a tree out of the forest. The work of the hands of the workmen with an axe, they deck it with silver and with gold. They fasten it with nails and with a hammer that it moved not. My brothers and sisters, this sounds like a Christmas tree. We cut the tree out of the forest and we deck it with silver. We take it to our house and we deck it with silver and gold. This is all paganism, my brother. This is all teaching of the, the heathens, non-believers of God. And a lot of our church peoples are still celebrating Christmas because it's beautiful, it's nice, but is it right? The SDA school, where one year they, 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 they had Christmas carols because it's beautiful to get the kids. I love events like that. But we can do that without these events of that, that adapted paganism on them. Seventh-day Adventists in Las Vegas celebrated it as well. Not all the churches, my brothers, there are some churches that will do it, some churches will don't. But I'm sharing you that the devil has implemented a seed already thousands of years, a thousand years ago. And a lot of people are starting to follow because it's been of old age, but it's not true. Here's a magazine of the SDA magazine, Why Jesus Washed Their Feet, which is all right. It's beautiful, but they had Pope Benedict washing the feet. University, Seventh-day Adventist University, having a, a picture of, of Jesus Christ with their hand. The Seventh-day Adventist Vaticano and Ventista is the Seventh-day Adventist church that goes to Sunday. These are all teaching. Here's, here's one of the conference meetings. The general conference of the church in session, the only body having authority to alter the structure of the church either in doctrines of, or organization. No one has the right to alter any doctrines of Jesus Christ, any doctrines of the Bible. Only God can alter it. No church has that right. My brothers and sisters, this is the general conference. This is not the conference. This is the general conference. As the general conference are the group of people that make decisions for the conference churches. The Seventh-day Adventist logo, I believe that it had a secret symbol, called, which is an upside-down cross. I know it does. It's just amazing how people started to change it. And then I sent emails as well, and people, and I believe a lot of people picked it up. So they said, no, no, it's actually a cross. So they, they, they emphasized the cross more so that it doesn't blend into the actual white logo that they have. But you can't miss the fact that there's an earth inside flame, a burning earth. Now they showed us, this, uh, they have their meanings in that, but it, it's just too much of a, con a coincidence. Things are starting to happen in the Seventh-day Adventist church. The cross is not satanic. 
This is the cross of St. Peter. He requested this form of crucifixion as he felt he was unworthy to be crucified in the same manner that Jesus died. Do your research. So this is one guy, he told me, I believe he was telling me and everybody else that was doing their research, say to do our research that the upside down cross has nothing to do with paganism. It has to do because Peter didn't, didn't, was felt unworthy to be crucified the same way as Jesus Christ did. So they put him upside down. So I did my research. And I actually found the, uh, the verse that they were actually set talking about. But the verse that they're talking about is not found in the Bible. It's found in the Acts of Peter from the Apocryphal New Testament. The Apocryphal New Testament are Christians are writing letters and witnessing what actually happened. So some of the things that they're saying are true in the Apocrypha, some of them are not. So we have to be careful. It is not written in the Bible. It's not written in the Bible, but it's written in the Acts of Peter, the Apocrypha New Testament. Crucify me thus with the head downward and not otherwise. You got to understand, Peter was a prisoner and they were real cruel back then. Why would the Roman soldiers give a request to a prisoner? It doesn't make sense. They've been crucifying uh, prisoners, and I believe there were all, a lot of them crucified upside down. But if Peter wanted to request to be crucified upside, upside down, do you really think the Roman soldiers will give him that request? He's a prisoner. They tortured Jesus like he was nobody. It just doesn't fit. The pictures doesn't fit. But in John chapter 21, verse 18, it tells us how, how Peter is going to die. Very truly, I tell you, when you were younger, you dressed yourself and went where you wanted. But when you are old, you would stretch out your hands and someone else will dress you and lead you where you do not want to go. Jesus said this to indicate that kind of death by which Peter would glorify God. Then he said to him, follow me. So it doesn't say that Peter was crucified upside down. It does say that he died as an old age. But whether he was crucified, he probably was. But it doesn't say clearly that he was crucified upside down. I found out that upside down cross is actually a peace cross called the Nero's cross. Peace cross, Nero's cross, or an upside down cross. Let's read history. History tells us that school board chairman Johan van Putzef told Dutch newspaper Charles that according to his research in the Roman era, the peace symbol was actually a Nero's cross or an upside down cross representing the torture and persecution of Christians. This makes a lot of sense to, sense to me, my brothers and sisters, because Nero was the one that was persecuting Christians saying, you're not allowed to have church, you can't do this. And he hated the Christians. Nero's cross was a symbol for Nero to represent everybody, to let everybody know that he persecuted our brothers and sisters. Over 60 million Protestants were killed by Nero, by the Roman Catholic Church, the papacy Rome. Now you're probably thinking, oh, you can't say this. You can look it up yourself. It's history. I'm not saying, I'm not saying with my own words, I'm saying it's through history. History tells me, so I'm telling you, so over 60 million people were persecuted by the Roman Catholic, Roman Catholic Church, Protestants. Well, before you turn this off, these were Protestants that stood against the Roman Catholic Church. So the question you have to ask yourself, who is the Protestants? These are Protestants that are Catholic members of the church. They were persecuting the Catholics that stood against the Roman papacy. Protestant was a name given to them because they protested against the Roman Catholic Church. My friend, if it happened back then in, in 538 AD, 60 million people stood for what they believed were persecuted. The disciples were persecuted and executed for what they believed. You would, if you were in that position, would you let your enemy kill you or just persecute you or execute you for something that you believe it's a lie millions of people died because they know for a fact that Jesus Christ is true his word is true that the Bible reveals so many things that people put a blind eye over it and say we should just pre preach about prosperity I preach about uh, prosperity every week but missions like this, we have to talk about doctrines. We have to talk about prophecy. It's the testimony of Jesus Christ. You know, he said, this is my gospel. Here's my gospel. When it came to his prophecy, according to Revelation 19, the prophecy is the testimony of Jesus Christ. So we're going to get deeper into his testimony. Every time you hear me saying prophecy, I'm talking about Jesus' testimony. And you, we got to wake up. 
This is not a revival. This mission is an awakening to wake us up, to realize that we have to let go of all the things that is, that is stopping us to have a good relationship with God. It's, I know it's hard. I know it's tough. It's hard to stop listening to worldly, worldly music. It's hard to stop cussing because I know there are Christians that still cuss at home to their kids. I know they're still using the S word or the F word when they get mad and, and it's, it's hard for them, but we have to lead by an example. How can we allow our kids to worship God when they see a whole different person at home? It starts with us parents. It starts with us elders. It starts with us leaders. Those who know that don't know what's right and wrong had to make a decision. I taught my kids. I taught my kids that Christmas is paganism at, at a young age. I wanted, I wanted them to know that the present that I'm giving to them in the, in the beginning of the year is the present that me and mom has, has worked for. It's our money. It's our sweat. I wanted them to appreciate their parents. I'm not going to give them a lie, even though it sounds good, even though it's beautiful. And people say it's young. No, I'm going to teach them the truth at a young age. And this is what we have to do. This whole mission is topics that people will weren't won't share about ministers don't want to talk about but we have to talk about it because it's in our churches it's in God's wife so we need to stop making excuses and understand we are we are actually getting deceived we are actually getting deceived by the things that the teachings of man's tradition oh man see I'm not a Seventh-day Adventist believer of going to church on Saturday because my parents was I left the church I couldn't stand the church. So when I'm speaking to you about the Sabbath is the Saturday, it's because I left this through my experiencing, searching my own self and doing the process of trying to prove that Saturday is not the Sunday day. Sunday, trying to prove that there is no God, I became a minister because the deeper I got into his word and not just around because people look in history and forget to look into his word. Look into his word. There's so much fruit. There's so much passion inside the people that died for, the, for a moment that we can have with Jesus Christ. Disciples died for you. The prophets went through so many pain. The people that believed in God were persecuted because they believed what they believed that Jesus Christ is the Savior. So what do you believe? What excuse do you have right now to make an excuse to say that you'll come to Jesus tomorrow? Let me just do my job because I need my money to, I need the money to pay the rent. So you work on Sabbath. You always, we always make these excuses, but sooner or later you're going to come to God and Jesus is going to look at you and you say, Father, I tried. He's going to say, I never knew you. Depart from me. The worst thing my dad on earth can tell me is say who you are. Who are you? I don't know you. Dad, it's me. Your son. The one you, you raised. When I was young, the one you taught how to ride a bike. Don't you know who I am? Who are you? There's going to be a time when we took light, because we take lightly of a prayer, to ask God for forgiveness, there is going to be a time when God will not answer your prayer. So stop making excuses and start making a difference. Let us pray. Gracious Lord, Heavenly Father, thank you, God, so much for giving me this opportunity that I may share your word in a way that our brothers and sisters can have a good understanding of what's actually happening in our churches. I ask you, Father, to please be with them in their search for you. Help them to build a relationship with you. Thank you, God, for your love and your guidance. In Jesus' name, we will serve and praise. Amen.